Got it. No problem. Recording. Um, I should say that I'm a, I'm a historian. Um, I also am affiliated with the College of Education at San Francisco State. So history and education is my intersection, just like I know uh, for most of you. And, um, you know, when we were developing the various flavors of the World History Project, and as we develop it more, um, we wanted to do a couple of things. And I'm going to start, I'm going to actually try to be slick enough to change between several different types of files as we go along here. So let me start with my PowerPoint here. So our graphic biographies are just that. They are one page um, biographies uh, of people from the past, um, people that we know about, but most often not people who are uh, the normal folks who get talked about uh, in, in a world history course. They are graphic, um, which means they're carefully designed comics. Um, they're carefully designed to use all the affordances and sort of advantages that comics have in terms of communicating using two modalities, if you will, using both art and text. Uh, and you might say that we developed them for sort of three reasons. And I'm going to tell you those three reasons, uh, and then I'm going to switch away from this presentation for a second just to show you kind of the list of what's available to you out there. And then we'll come back. We'll talk a little bit more about what the graphic biographies do, and then we're going to do some work together. That's hopefully also fun, work and fun. So why did we develop these graphic biographies? Okay, there are three reasons. So the first is that we're always working on literacy for students. Um, and um, we know pretty well the, the, the literature on, uh, on, on, on comics and how folks learn using comics, how folks learn to read comics. And a really sort of deep, um, slow read through a comic, especially like a one page comic like this that's carefully designed in this way, can really help students learn how to decode all kinds of texts, um, whether written or images or videos or whatever. So we're gonna demonstrate that in a little bit. The second is we, we designed these uh, one page graphic biographies to really work with the big questions in world history. So I'll show you an example when we talk about the industrial revolution uh, in, just a, in just a little bit. But you know, you may be teaching sixth grade even and really, you know, looking at the ancient world. Um, that's fine. You know, we've got graphic biographies that engage the big questions of, um, you know, the Roman Empire or Han Dynasty China. How did they really operate? Um, <clears throat> how, how did the Mongols really rule? You know, these kinds of, you know, sort of big questions and also the connections and movements of people. Um, so we're, we're, we're therefore, we're, what we're doing is we're creating these graphic biographies as evidence, another piece of evidence for students to consider in looking at the big questions. And in particular, a piece of evidence that's at a really small scale, the scale of literally an individual. Um, and then they can use this evidence uh, then to, to, to kind of, again, engage the big questions um, alongside the other bits of evidence that you may give them, the other kinds of readings, the videos, et cetera. Um, and then finally, you know, we have a focus of inclusivity here. Um, and that focus on inclusivity means that we're really looking at graphic biographies that um, are representative of the kinds of students that we have, the wide range of students that we have, where they can see themselves in these stories, but authentically so. So not kind of like tacked on to the end of a unit, but actually embedded in the unit so that part of your answer about um, what, uh, say what was going on with um, uh, the, the, the age of, you know, the quote unquote age of exploration, right? The, the, the um, part of what we do then is we can actually look at these things from the perspectives of uh, African sailors or uh, indigenous Americans who are visiting Europe and these sorts of things. So all of these three goals kind of come together then. So now let, let, me, let, me, um, let me share with you really quickly. Um, we have a document which you can find if you go to the, the OER project, which has a list of all of the graphic biographies that we have. Um, and you'll see that you know, we've got about 32 of them now, we keep building it, but we've got you know, representatives from across time, um, uh, around the world, we've got really heavy coverage in periods like the, the medieval period, if you will, um, 
1200 to the present, uh, 1500 to the present, also um, really dense 1750 to the present uh, era because of a lot of the state standards over here in places like California or New York emphasize those periods. Um, but altogether, uh, our graphic biographies really kind of work the world, if you will. Um, they're very sort of broad based. So we can uh, happily share with you uh, that list. It's also, if you go onto the OER project website, um, you'll find it pretty easily. Um, but let's talk a little bit about these graphic biographies then um, and why they're hopefully kind of fun. So, okay, so let me give you some context, right? We're gonna zoom in on one because I think kind of modeling the stuff is, is, is the best. So, so here's, here's our industrial revolution unit for, um, in this case, the 1750 to the present course, um, which isn't, you know, which isn't AP. Um, we've got an industrial revolution unit in the AP course, uh, in the 1200 to the present course, in the course that starts all the way sort of with human evolution and comes to the present. But for the industrial revolution unit in the 1750 course, we've got this big question, which is essentially how was the industrial revolution experienced differently by people around the world? Um, and it's a good question because it helps you get at what were the changes that the industrial revolution brings, um, but also to see the ways in which this might be um, unevenly experienced. Um, you know, you wanna connect it to things like um, uh, uh, income inequality today, things like that. You can help set up that unit here. Um, so we start with a, we start with a video um, on the origins of the Industrial Revolution that we built ourselves, um, which in part asks the question, where should we look for the origin of the Industrial Revolution? Should we look in Britain? Should we look in the British Empire? Should we look globally? Um, and then we also tell the story of sort of what were, we give them an, an overview of what were the the global transformations of the industrial revolution. And we do all of this to give them some global level evidence, right? So we've got this big evidence. And then we start getting uh, a little bit more and giving them regional case studies. So we look at deindustrialization in India um, as an example. Um, we look at the industrial revolution in Japan uh, as an example. We look at the industrial revolution in Egypt. Um, we look at things like, uh, we begin to look at specific uh, topics. So we look at the beginning of really high greenhouse gas emissions um, through a data-based unit, uh, uh, sorry, lesson plan, where they're really focusing on data. Um, we have a really great article on industrialization and migration, where we're looking at people all over the world moving to new places through the Industrial Revolution, all of this. But you know, I mean, when you when you do something like this, the one thing that's missing is really human beings, right? We've got this big level story and we've got data and we've got whatever, but where are the human beings and their experiences? So here we begin then to give them the graphic biographies that'll help them to um, provide that sort of individual level experience. And, and we've got two for this unit so far. Um, one of them is Iwasaki Yataro, who is the founder of Mitsubishi. Um, and we can look at really sort of the Japanese industrial revolution in a comic, a one page graphic biography that's whose design is actually inspired by manga. And so, you know, students can kind of look at and think about how and why those design choices were made. That's, that's part of the lesson plan that we give is to think about all these design choices. And then we've got Odalie Bader, who was a, a German um, working woman and labor organizer. And I'm gonna show you how we, how we spend a half a class on uh, uh, how some of our best teachers, I should say a lot of the teachers that we work with spend half a class looking at one of these graphic biographies. So we're gonna look at Odalie Bader's graphic biography here. Um, and you know, I'm a real believer in reading comics slowly, especially this is, this is one page. Um, and you know, it's some folks might want to move fast over it because it's actually not that much text. Um, but we want to move slowly and really help the students to decode it. Um, so you're going to get a chance to work on decoding a graphic biography yourselves uh, in a little bit. But uh, I'm going to kind of walk you through this one. Um, and what I would tell my students first is, okay, let's sit back and look at the whole thing for a minute. You got to look at the whole thing. Um, we want to look at sort of the uh, the color scheme, 
Um, so, you know, here we get this very muted and gray color scheme. Some of our other graphic biographies are very colorful. Um, and think about why did the artist choose to use this very muted color scheme? Um, what's, the, what's, what's the purpose? What, what is the message that we get? The sort of message of, you know, daily work and drudgery. Um, and then we look, we look uh, at, the, at the gutters. We look at everything behind the actual panels. So we can see and we can identify here eight panels where the story takes place. But we look behind and we say, What's going on in those gutters? And what are we supposed to be getting from that? And, you know, this one's a little bit hard to figure out what's going on. Students might debate for a little while, but basically what you've got here is you've got a textile factory and you've got women working. Um, and so we're seeing that the factory is the location where all the story is taking place here. And we get the sort of the idea of these are people who are working their life, right? That's what they do. They, they work their whole life. Um, and students might also then begin to see things like they may, may begin to see that there's um, a, a factory um, around that first panel in the top left. Um, they may see the pipes and they may say, why are the pipes there? And what do the pipes tell us? Well, you know, one of the pipes tells us who the author and the artist are here. Um, so we need to know that information. Um, they might also note that the pipes tell us how to read this. Um, they connect the end of one line with the beginning of another one. So they're kind of guides as well to which direction we should read in. And then having surveyed the whole thing, um, students may be ready to sort of zoom in and begin their analysis. So um, they can look at that first panel and they can say, um, first of all, what are, what are the first words there? Those are the name of a person um, and the dates that person lived. And, Look, what, it, what is the style that they're done in? It's kind of like a metal plaque. Um, what can we learn from that? Um, you know, this is a very industrial period. Uh, they might also pick up that metal plaques are normally put on buildings where important people lived. And maybe there's an argument being made here that this woman that they're gonna read about was actually important in some way. And when they read the first text, they should be able to identify that this is uh, a guiding text. This isn't somebody speaking uh, there. So um, this text is there to guide them and it tells them about Odile Bader being born in Germany. Um, <clears throat> and as they continue to read then in the next panel, they're going to say, um, oh, that's a weird panel. There's two things going on there. There's a factory and there's a home. Um, who are the people in the factory? It looks like, looks like those are mostly men and the, the woman here is at home with the child, but the two are kind of smushed together. They're not separate panels. So what is the artist telling us in smushing these, these together and juxtaposing them um, about Odile's young life? And then the next panel is kind of fun because it's about school. And you know the guide text is saying, look, in school, she learned to read, uh, to, to read, to write, and to do basic math. You know That's what the school curriculum was. But then below there's some other words that are completely different, it seems, right? The girls there were educated above all to have good manners. The ideal woman of the time was gentle, tender, and sweet. And you can ask them, whose words do you think these are, right? Look, you can see that it's a different shaped box. You can see that it's, a, it's, it's got quote marks around it. So it's a quotation from someone. Um, you might be able to see that it's a, it's a different font. So does that suggest that somebody different is speaking here and it's not the, not the author who's speaking? And then you might be able to say, you know, let's juxtapose these two things, right? On the one hand, there are things that you think, you know, kids are supposed to learn in school, right? Reading, writing, and math. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the three R's, right? Reading, writing, arithmetic. Um, but on the other hand, the girls are being educated to be gentle, tender, and sweet. You know, what does that tell us about how women were experiencing this time. And, and you might ask, does this kind of thing happen in our schools today? Are, we, are you just here leading, learning reading and math uh, and writing or, or are people being taught how to act in some way? Um, do girls and boys get sort of different lessons these days or are they the same? And then when we can go on and we go down, we follow the pipe to the next, to the next line, um, and we learn about um, her life as she begins to really quickly 
uh, at the age of 10, enters sort of the working world. Um, so at 10, she leaves school and then she becomes a seamstress. And we see her working at home in the evenings. Um, we see the light, the lamp keeping her going. Um, we can see the expression on her face and we can talk about why the artist gave her that expression on her face. Um, and then again, there's this quote right over there. So by this time, students may be beginning to suspect that the quote is actually from Odalie Botter's own work mouth or her own writing, but they may not know yet, right? Um, but they can begin to then sort of juxtapose that those bits of things, you know, this is the dead giveaway in this quote, of course, is that it says me, right? And so it becomes first person there. Um, and that she didn't get to choose, right? What she was going to do, that's what girls did. And, then in the central panel, and we make it the central panel, the artist made it the central panel because this is sort of the central feature of, of the life she, she, she lived, was working in a wool factory in these terrible conditions. Um, and there's that really important quote, very short quote there. I was so miserable that I stood at the machine half like a corpse. Um, and you know, you can spend some time looking at what's going on in this panel. We're, we're gonna move on uh, in the next panel then of course we've got the strike happening that Odile becomes, this is where she becomes politicized. This is where she becomes um, a worker's agent and advocate. And you know, the text tells you that, but you can also see from the stance. And so you say, you can ask students, why do you think the artist chose to depict these women from below? Why did the artist choose to depict these women, you know, with their arms crossed and standing tall? Um, and of course, you know, there you begin to talk about the way that um, uh, art can be, you know, designed to uh, show people in particular poses, can show their strength, etc. Um, and you come to the last panel um, where the, th the thesis statement is really, and Odalie is the one giving the thesis statement. And here it's 100% clear that those oval um, boxes are actually her speaking. Um, and that you see that because, of course, it's designed with the, with the, with the line from her mouth. Um, and the very last thing you see is her typewriter, um, where she was typing all these words that come down to us. So, you know, students can then spend some time decoding the arguments um, that are put forward here. And a lot of teachers have students do that kind of thing in groups. Um, they also, after that, right, so we give them also content questions because the other thing that's important for us is how does this relate to this bigger question of, um, uh, how different people experience the industrial revolution. And, you know, so we build up to these questions like how common or shared was Odalie's experience? And actually, if you go back and read the text of that particular graphic biography, the answer is in there because Odalie is making an argument that tens of thousands of women like her are experiencing the same thing. Now, the, 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 the graphic biography of Iwasaki Yatoro is completely different. It has a very different sort of experience and message in it. Um, and in some ways it's very, it's, it's, it's much more uh, unique rather than sort of a really shared uh, biographical experience. And we help students to understand that. Um, but what we do is we want them to begin to get at then the ability to use this to answer kind of the big questions. So let me just say that I, I do this kind of decoding with another graphic biography in a video. Uh, and Jason's actually going to drop the video link into the chat um, somewhere there uh, at some point. Um, uh, that's on YouTube, how to decode a graphic biography. Uh, and we do it with Islam Al-Hashal, which is, who is uh, a 10th grader, or she was a 10th grader two years ago when we interviewed her, um, talking about the immigrant experience today. Islam Al-Hashal is an immigrant who is in Ohio today, um, but she came from Syria and she agreed to share her story with us as part of the, our unit on the, on the contemporary world, um, which you can find, of course, in the World History Project. Um, there are other places where you can see people do this kind of um, slow read of graphic biographies and other kinds of graphics, but it's a really important tool um, in helping students to sort of pull meaning out of these things. Um, and what we do is we provide a lesson plan for you alongside each of the graphic biographies. And the lesson plan that we provide alongside each of the graphic biographies includes all these kinds of questions. It includes an actual written biography for you. That's a longer, more extensive biography that you as a teacher might wanna use. Um, and um, in that way, it kind of uh, can prep you. 
uh, to talk to the students about these individuals. And it includes all of the um, questions um, that students might want to answer, um, both in terms of content development and kind of moving forward into relating these smaller questions to the bigger questions. Hey, Trevor, can we pause for a second? I've got one question in the chat, and I want to see if anyone else had anything else to kind of add. Yeah, no, that's it. great. And I didn't see there was a question pop up. That, that's, that's why they that's why pay me the big bucks. I get the flag for you. But I know, right? Yeah, that's right. The question um, is, um, so will you be able to share this PowerPoint afterwards? Yeah, I'm perfectly happy to share the, 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 the entire PowerPoint. That's what I've previously done. Um, and I'll just I'll just send it to you uh, again. Um, I'll send it to you, Jason, and you can distribute it, right? Yeah. So yeah. That, that works too. Also, something to note is I am working on getting the videos of each of these sessions posted on our PD page. So soon that'll be an option as well. But at the very least, we can definitely get you a copy of the the PowerPoint deck, Pan, if you that's something you'd want to hold on to. Um, but while we're at it, any other questions came up, any wonderings, big ideas you want to kind of discuss as uh, Trevor was walking through that first part of our session? Can, can I ask while you're thinking about it, just if you would be willing to put in chat what 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 grade you teach, I would it would really help me also in, in the next little bit, if you don't mind. Freshmen and sophomores, it's an interesting group. Yeah, together. They run the full gamut. All right, yeah, no, that's fantastic. So, but really the fun part of this is not listening to me drone on. It's, it's, it's uh, you as a group. Um, maybe choosing uh, another graphic biography to kind of work on. Um, well, Southern Nevada, that's fantastic, all right. Yeah. yeah, so we do have some six, seven as well as high school, yeah. Um, it's really interesting because we're really aiming to be able to, you know, in some ways reach, reach middle school as well as high school with these. Um, so let me let me let me quickly run you through a couple other graphic biographies that we have, and then Jason, it's up to you whether we want to do this just together as a group or divide into two groups and have two breakout rooms. Um, let, maybe. I mean, we've got including me and you, so we've got six folks in here. It might be good for them to get that small group feel to this, so that folks you know feel like they can uh, expand okay. it a little bit. All so right. we'll have two groups of three. All right, good. All right, fantastic. So let me show you a couple of uh, the graphic biographies I'm really excited about, folks, um, including some of our, our newest ones. So um, what we're going to do when we divide into groups, um, and, and Jason and I will, 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 will help you to remember this, is um, we're going to figure out, we're going to choose one graphic biography in each group, and we're going to write a world history problem for which this graphic biography might be evidence. So some sort of wider problem, um, some sort of wider uh, moment of inquiry that you might be giving to students um, that this could be evidence for. Um, and then we wanna talk a little bit about the design elements that you might pause with students and kind of uh, talk about why they might be there to help students do some decoding. And then we're gonna try to develop a couple of content questions that we would add students. Um, we don't have to get to four to five necessarily, um, but we're going to spend a little bit of time developing those content questions and we'll see, we'll see sort of how it goes. Um, so we will, uh, we will remember to, uh, to remind you when we get in our groups about what we're doing uh, with each of these, but let's, let's take a look at these graphic biographies because I really am excited by them. Um, so this is the first one and I think this is a really unique one and I'm, I'm super excited about it. Um, this is the story of Coupe, uh, a Polynesian figure who in uh, Aotearoa, um, New Zealand is seen as sort of a, a founding figure. Um, and a lot of what we've got here comes from an oral historian, uh, Himiona Kamira, um, which is really exciting because I think it gives students an opportunity to think about oral history um, and how oral history works and what it means. And um, we've got also some sense of what the Maori say is the meaning of the story to them. So we get a sense of sort of relevance and meaningful history. Um, as you can see, this one is much more colorful. 
Uh, so this is a really good one, uh, I think. Here's a second one. This is a, 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 a new way of reading the Mongol Empire uh, based on some gender research um, that's really interesting that argues um, that it's looking at Sorgatani Becky, who was a, <clears throat> a royal princess. Um, these royal princesses were often from sort of conquered or allied people um, who married into uh, the Mongol imperial ranks. And, you know, there's an argument here that their relationships with each other were kind of what kept the empire together. So it's, it's, it's something of a feminist rereading of the Mongol empire. Um, which is why I find this one to be sort of really interesting. I also think that the artist did a really great job in just sort of showing that sort of meaning using the art. So there's Sorgatani Becky. Um, this is LaDonna Brave Bull Allard, um, who is one of the leaders, who has been one of the leaders of the, um, the, the da No Dapple, the, the fight against the uh, pipeline in Sioux land, um, and who is a historian herself. So she's a contemporary figure, she's a current figure, um, but we, we, we go a lot into the history that she invokes here. Um, and I think this is the last one is Domingos Alvarez, who was an enslaved man from West Africa, who um, was a healing practitioner and who in the Americas was successful in continually sort of building a community around himself and kept getting moved around because he was perceived as being dangerous because he was so successful in doing that. So that's Domingos Alvarez. So I think those are the four that we, we chose. Did we choose a fifth? Oh, we did choose the fifth. So this is Edmund Burke. I actually love using Edmund Burke in American classrooms. Um, you know, I know he's an old white man and that's not in vogue <laughs> in some ways, but he's such an interesting figure because he is claimed as the father of sort of modern conservatism. Um, which is really interesting. But at the same time, at the time, he was an infamous liberal um, and kind of seeing his political view looking sort of both ways at the time, which is the, the, the core metaphor here, um, actually helped students in some ways to understand how our modern ideas of conservative and liberal really developed. Um, so he's quite an interesting figure. Um, and I think, again, this is a pretty good comic. So Jason's going to, uh, provide those to everyone, I think, Jason. Is that right? Yep, he's yep. provided I a link. I just dropped the link into the chat. This is going to be a Dropbox folder with the five different documents in it. And then I'm going to add a... Joel's driving. Drive safely, we we understand. Yep. I'm going to, uh, Trevor, at your, uh, at your call, I'm going to open up the, the rooms. Yeah, no, I think, and you're going to put each of us in one room, right? Ooh. I am. We're not formally assigned, but we'll be able to bounce around. Um, right. Right. Okay. And um, Lindsay just joined, and so you might want to put Lindsay in the room, too. That's a good call. Hi, Lindsay. All right, Lindsay, we got you in the room as well. Cool. All right, I'm going to hit the button. All right, rooms are now uh, open. All right, Trev, which one would you like to go to first? Um, well, I don't mind which one. I guess I might as well just go to one and you can go to two for now. Cool. So, so, I'll, uh, okay. How long do you want to keep them in the room before I close them down? Um, I mean, 15 minutes is probably good, don't you think? Yeah, sounds good. Cool. So I'll set the timer. I'll uh, you'll get the message when I'm shutting things down, but we'll aim to be back together at 1037. No, I'm sorry, 1047. Okay. Cool. All right, well, not 1047. Okay. You're, you know, you know the time. <laughs> I do. We're good. Okay. Bye. I know, Trevor, they're deep in conversation, shaking their fists at the sky as I've ended their their dialogue abruptly. So Eunice is in Washington State. Lindsay, where are you? Um, Dearborn, Michigan. Dearborn, Michigan. How about that? Okay. I, I am a, a proud graduate of the Ohio State University. So oh, I've, I've been conditioned to feel negatively about Michigan folks, but then I meet them and they're lovely. So, you know, I got to empty that cup of misconception from my college days. 
we got okay so everyone is starting to come back looks like we got everybody yep all right Trev, the floor is yours um all right well i mean i know what group number one did uh as it were i'm really interested in what group number two did i guess um i'll put up coupe for a second and then i'm wondering if anyone from group number one is willing to talk a little bit about what we discussed See, I didn't do that thing where I, 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 I said at the beginning, somebody needs to do it who's not me. <laughs> I can talk if you want. Thank you. <laughs> so um, we were looking at this just because of all the vibrant colors and everything and kind of discussed where we would use this in a course, in our course, you know, especially if you're teaching like 1200, um, which most of us, I think, in our group were. And we kind of decided that this would be a good spot either exploration or just prior to exploration. Um, and it talks about how this, you know, the main question you see in the center there is coupe, is it historic or is it a mythical figure? And we've talked about all the colors and the vibrancy of it and how the first panel kind of starts off as the gray and why we thought maybe it was gray. And we kind of discussed how it was dream sequence or something like that. And then it goes on to tell the story and it's just a small story, but you still get quite a bit from it. And then at the bottom, you have like um, the three reasons why this is important to the Maori people. And we kind of discussed how the colors in the boxes on the bottom left were brown and not vibrant again, but still it has a lot of um, meaning behind it. And Trevor told us that those are um, how the Maori the Polynesians mapped the currents so they could know where they were going, which was really cool. Um, and then we kind of discussed on what questions we might ask our students about this to get them thinking about it. And, you know, um, I can't remember all the questions, but I know one of them, it's like the one that we kind of all liked is, what do you guys think? Is this historic or is it mythical? And why do you feel that way? You know, what makes it mythical? What makes it historic? Why? Um, is oral history not looked at as being valid as much as written history? And um, thank you, Trevor. <laughs> I see it there. Uh, what are the th three? What are the three ways the Maori use the story? What do you think is a story mythical? And what's the difference between how the Maori and the Europeans interpret the story? Just to get our kids to like thinking even more. Yeah, so I thought, I mean, I, th I think we had a great, a great discussion. Um, and, you know, it is interesting to think about the fact that one, one note that I, that I took that was, I think, is that there isn't a lot out there for Polynesian history for students to work with other than, you know, blurbs in, in, in textbooks and stuff. So I think that was part of the reason we chose this one. So what about the second group? Is anyone willing to talk about what you chose to do? I am going to do the cold call thing. Um, All right. And this is mostly because I know it's not super, super early there. She's in Michigan and she joined us late. And also I went to Ohio State and I've got to, you know, it's just, it's a thing. I'm trying to shake it, but it's too late now. So Lindsay is going to uh, be my choice to kind of debrief what we talked about a little bit. Well, I'll tell you these Midwestern rivalries are serious. <laughs> It's all love. We big we the Midwest is a lovely place. Everyone is nice, and uh, that is also why I went for for Lindsay because I know she's going to be uh, not angry at me afterwards. Hopefully, of course not. Never. There we go. <laughs> um, so I I don't want to mispronounce your name, but I believe you're Eunice, right? Because um, I missed the introductions. Um, she uh, saved us with a wonderful uh, set of questions um, for this image that we looked at, um, which was uh, about the Mongol Empire, um, cartoon number two. Um, and it looked specifically at really the role of women um, who are not usually seen uh, as, you know, the leaders of, of empires, how they exercise power um, during that time. 
Um, and so she posed the question for our group um, to, uh, this is paraphrasing, but to um, what extent or, or to which extent did women um, exercise or hold power in the Mongol empire? Um, and after, after some tweaking, we kind of came to um, a, a, maybe a different kind of question, um, just posing it to the students, did women um, change the world during um, the Mongol empire? Or, you know, what impact di did women have at this time? Um, as our kind of central question. Some other things we talked about were the color scheme, right? Um, the, the past group was just talking about the vibrant colors. Here again, uh, Eunice had spent some time living in, in this part of the world. And so for her, these colors were really evocative of um, a kind of like steppe or even like a, a desert kind of dry climate um, and what, what to make of that. And how, how, how does that add or sort of paint um, this period in time, this people, this culture? Yeah, I think that's really great. I mean, if you don't mind me adding a few things, uh, you know, part of the reason we did this is that there was this work that has been coming out about Imperial Mongol women. And when we study the Mongol empire, you know, usually the question is, were they these terrible destroyers or were they these great empire builders? And the answer is both, but, um, but it really focuses on men. And, you know, behind the scenes, these women, these, these networks of sisters and, 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 and stepsisters and such may have like played this huge role. So this is just kind of, I think that's a great question you chose because that's what we want to do. We just want to insert in students' minds, you know, this sort of like way of modifying or challenging the big narrative that they have using these sort of individual pieces. And I also just think that Liz did a great job of sort of demonstrating the power of these women using the art, whether it's that, that sort of gutter in the middle where you've got the three women connected to each other and all the sort of lines connecting them or, or the women across the top all connected to each other, you know, it just gives this sort of idea of connections or or these two women confronting each other in the bottom panel where they're, they're so tall, they tower above the yurts and they kind of almost like um, uh, have, you know, uh, 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 include the yurts kind of in their sort of, you know, their, their powers, the power of the home uh, in many ways. So, I mean, I think, I think that you hit on those things really well. I think this is, a, this is a really useful one if you're spending time on the Mongol empire because it does kind of insert that question for students. Um, into their minds. So um, I wanted to, if you'll just indulge me, just spend a few minutes on, on, on one other part of this, which is that, um, so some of the, some teachers that many of you know, in fact, who are here, um, especially Juliana Horowitz have been designing lesson plans. And these are in the OER community. You can, you can find them in the community discussion where they have students make their own comics. And we haven't really kind of adopted a unified lesson plan to do that. Um, we're watching how the teachers are doing it right now, but they get some really interesting results. And I just wanted to show you a couple things very quickly. Um, so here are some strong examples of students that in many cases really came to understand the affordances of comics uh, and what they can do. And um, especially this one, if you look at the Opium War one on the left, it's pretty amazing how they use sort of charts and maps and images. And, you know, this isn't an artist, right? I mean, so to speak, this isn't a student who's necessarily, but they figured out ways to communicate their message about um, the, op the, the opium war um, in, in, in a way that's very sort of comic-like. It even, even has a nice gutter behind it, right? It's got a nice background um, that kind of helps with that. So, you know, that those were very impressive and we're looking at those. Here, here's a more on-level student. Um, but what I wanted to show you here is this student's development over time. You can see um, from their first assignment, which was the Opium War assignment, to their Women in World War I assignment with these great biographies of women in World War I, um, including both patriots who chose to go to war and people, who, women who went to jail for their opposition to the war in different countries, um, to, the, to the Arab Spring assignment. Um, and you really see students um, growing through this as they use more and more of these graphic biographies becoming sort of stronger and stronger in their ability to um, develop the, the sort of this medium of communication. 
Um, there's a question in the chat, maybe. No, that's me. I just wanted to say I, I need to leave. That's your, that, okay, good. But I want right. to drop the exit ticket for everyone just so yeah. they have it before I load. But one sorry, minute. guys. Let I'm... me just do this last one really quickly, Jason, just really quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, so this was a student who was 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 not a strong student in general, um, and again, we just wanted to show their development over time. You know, from really a very simple comic. I mean, again, it's a student who doesn't draw. You know, that's fine. To being able to sort of tell a story using you know. So here you have a story of the Arab Spring that tells a story about why the Arab Spring happened using things like an unemployment chart. Um, and sort of, you know, geopolitics and things like that, and kind of like really getting into the narrative. So, I mean, what we are seeing in these is that students who repeatedly touch these graphic histories, these graphic biographies, do over time sort of develop, you know, stronger, clearly stronger reading comprehension in their sources, um, a greater engagement, um, and an ability to sort of apply this to the bigger questions that they're answering. I don't have that quantified. I realize it's just a claim at this time. Um, but we are going to be um, spending as much time as we can kind of developing and seeing what outcomes this does have for students over time. And, and, and the, the folks who are um, using them repeatedly, having students touch them repeatedly, are seeing, I think, some pretty great outcomes. So, Jason, I'll stop there and turn things back over to you. And, and thank you. Yeah, no problem. So we are going to end. And this is uh, a little bit more abrupt than I love because I've got to run to another meeting. We've got a really packed couple of weeks because we're doing our large uh, conference uh, the first week of August. If anyone's available, please join. Um, you probably have gotten about a billion emails about it so far. So it's going to be a really great uh, opportunity for you to hear some big ideas from folks. But I want to start by saying thank you to Trev for sharing his wisdom with us. Uh, it's always amazing to kind of not only see these resources, but to kind of see the way the folks who really know this work think about these resources. I know every time I've heard him do this, I've, uh, I've learned a lot about areas of the world I've never really thought deeply about or techniques that I thought were just uh, my own kind of juvenile way of exploring uh, a narrative. Like I, to this day, still love a good graphic novel. I just, I, I watched Loki. I'm a big Marvel extended universe person. And it kind of drew me back into uh, graphic novels. I literally got a Marvel Unlimited subscription yesterday. Um, I have not told my wife because I think she'll think less of me, but I, I really love the medium. And Trevor really gave me the kind of permission structure to, to, to see that it actually is more to just, you know, a childhood obsession. It's something that is buried. Um, I'm sorry, it's, it's embedded with, with these literary techniques and, and, uh, and strategies that we don't notice. And that's the kind of amazing way that we can get students to kind of dial in. We get them with these techniques that they know and they love, and we allow them to see the world through that. That's no different from using uh, TikTok videos as formative assessments or asking students to kind of bring some of that youth culture into your, your, your classes. Uh, so I really kind of put this side by side by that. So as you kind of go back into your world, you connect with your family and your friends, and you start thinking about preparing for the next school year, uh, keep us in mind. We, like I said in the beginning, we are uh, we are here. We're trying to connect you guys with the work um, by giving you a face and an email address, and this is that. So as you kind of dive in, as you get some more uh, questions about the work, feel free to reach out. Our exit ticket is going to be a great way to kind of share your feedback about the session and also to kind of drop any questions that have come up. Uh, please, please, please fill them out. I promise you we read them. We internalize your feedback. We champion your your uh, your uh, your highs. We want to we want to do that for more uh, folks as we go deeper into this. We'll have another session around this time at the end of August. Um, and if you have any friends who'd like to be a part of it, uh, Trevor would love to uh, share his thoughts with them as well. Um, but Trevor dropped his email address into the chat. I am going to drop mine if I can. I'm not a multitasker, so and I type really slow. So when I'm, when I'm done talking, I'm going to drop that in as well. But uh, unless you have any questions, um, feel free to uh, take our link today to ticket, and uh, we'll see you in the in the in the, the near future, hopefully. Yeah, thank you all very, very much, folks. Have a good rest of your morning. Yeah, it's still morning everywhere in the continental thank US. Thank you. Bye, folks.
Thank you so much, guys. Good to see you again, Trevor. And I just dropped my email address. Yeah. That's it. Huh? Thank you, Jason. No, thank you. I think I, 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 think I typed it wrong. <laughs> well, you, you just added a comma in there. Everyone take the comma out. Well, so, like, I can't type when people are looking at me. It, it's, it has not faded away over Zoom. I can feel the <laughs> eyes like, I'm going to get this wrong. Okay. Yeah. Trev, you're a rock star. We'll talk soon. See ya. Yeah, you too. Take care, bro. Have a good one. You too, man.